In this video, we'll cover some of the basic features of the RAD Combo Box, including connecting it to the database, load on demand, and autocomplete while being able to select multiple items. We'll show how to add the RAD Combo Box to your web application and how to bind it to a data source. We'll look at the load on demand feature and how it can be used to improve the user's perception of response time. We'll show how to make use of the autocomplete feature, including lists of multiple items. We'll begin the demonstration by creating a new ASP.NET AJAX-enabled website. And the reason that we use that template is because it automatically places a script manager component onto the design surface for us, and it also includes some settings inside the web config file that enable the communication between the client and the web application. Now because we want to hook our RAD combo box up to some data, let's add a SQL data source. We'll configure the data source to connect to the Northwind database. We're going to select the products table, all columns from that table, and finish. And then the next component that we're going to add is going to be a RAD combo box. The combo box will get connected up to the data source that we just created. I'm going to select a different skin. The skin I'm going to use is going to be the Telerik skin. And we'll close up the smart tag. And then we'll set a couple of properties on the combo box. The properties that we need to set are the data text field, which is the product name. And we'll set the data value field, which is the product ID. Now in its simplest form, that's all you need to do to hook the combo box up to a data source and be able to run your application. And you see we've got a combo box with all of the products from the Northwind catalog. Okay, so a drop down that just displays some products isn't real exciting, but as we start extending the application, let's say we put a couple of labels on the screen, and the first one is going to just say selected item price, and the second label is going to contain the price of the product that we select inside the drop down box. So if we select the drop down and then go over to the selected index changed event handler, and what we might do is put the price into that label. Now one way we could get the price would be to go back to the database and retrieve it. But another approach we can take is to include the price in the attributes of the combo box list item. So you see what we do is select out the item that's at the selected index, in other words the item that we've selected, and we take the attribute unit price from that item and we convert it to decimal, format that into a string and then place it into the label price dot text. Well where did this come from? And the answer is that when we're doing the data binding on the items that are going into our combo box, we're going to go handle that event as well. And we're going to paste in some code here that says the attribute called unit price on our combo box item is going to be the price that comes off of the data item associated with the item that is getting bound to the data at this point. And this unit price column, of course, comes off of our SQL data source because we selected all of the items in that products view. And another thing that we need to do to get this to be functional is to make sure that when the selected index changes, we trigger this auto post back so that it'll go and update our label for us. So if we run the application now, and select an item from the drop-down, like Grandma's Boysenberry Spread, it goes back to the web server and updates the item price, telling us it's $25. Now you notice we did a post back there. So there's still one more thing we can do to make this a little bit snappier. And in order to solve this, what I'm going to do is take a RAD AJAX panel and drop it onto our form. I'm just going to go ahead and close up the smart tag. And then I'm going to take our combo box and our two labels, and I'm going to move them all down into the RAD AJAX panel. And now I've put a break tag in between this drop down box and these two labels so that we won't have problems with spacing. It'll show up the way that I want it to. And if we run the application now, you can see that when I select one of the items from the drop down list, the price is displayed immediately without a post back here in this label that we've set aside for that purpose. 
So that's a baby step about how you use the RAD AJAX components to tie all of this together to get a more pleasant user experience in the applications that you write. And there's other videos that have been made on the AJAX components, so be sure and see those as well. So the next subject that we want to address is load on demand. And the point of load on demand is going to be that when you want to add a lot of items into your RAD combo box, sometimes you might only want to display 10 at a time. And what this does for you is it, it makes the package that's being sent down the wire to your client application a little bit smaller, which means it's going to be a little more a little quicker, a little more responsive. And then as you need more data, it'll be asked for in an Ajaxified manner back to the application server and the user will see it without experiencing a post back. So let's see how you set that up. And we'll just start by getting rid of these two components because they're not going to be part of that example. And as it turns out, this is one of those things that the RAD combo box will do for itself without an AJAX panel. So I'm going to move our combo box back outside the AJAX panel and get rid of the AJAX panel for now. And I'm going to set the combo box so that it's a little bit wider so that when the items display, we can pretty much see them on just one line. Now there's some nuts and bolts configuration that you need to do in order to get the load on demand working. And one of those is to go to this Enable Load On Demand property and set it to true. And because I might want to type something into the combo box and go search for it, I'm going to say Allow Custom Text to be true. Now when my drop down actually drops down, I want a way at the bottom to tell it that I want to be able to see more results. And that's set with this Show More Results box property. So we'll set that to true and that'll make an arrow visible at the bottom of our drop-down. Finally, I want to have a second method besides this Show More Results box to be able to call up more items. And that's going to be done with this Enable Virtual Scrolling property. And what that'll do is it'll leave me a little bit of space on my vertical scroll bar so that if I click down in that area or scroll down to that area and there's nothing more to display, the virtual scroll will go and bring some more items in. So that's all the properties that we need to set to have load on demand. We also need to set one event handler. And that's going to be this items requested event handler. And while I'm here, let's just get rid of this other code so that we don't get the program confused because things like label price aren't there anymore. Now I'm going to paste in some code that I have previously written and you can see it's objecting a little bit to the fact that it doesn't know about RAD combo box and the SQL data adapters and so forth. And that's because we need to import a couple of additional namespaces and that would be system data, system data SQL client and of course the Telerik web UI namespace and now it knows about all that and the IntelliSense errors have gone away. So let's take a look at what this code is doing for us. The first thing it does is sets up a SQL statement to, is to select everything from the products where the product name is like e.txt. Now this e is the combo box items request event args that's passed in as a parameter here and the text is the text that is typed into the combo box. Then we set up a data adapter and a new data table and fill the table with the results that are returned by this query. So the heart of this function is this loop here. Uh, now this number 10 is just an arbitrary number. It's the new items are going to be returned every time to the combo box. The item offset is the number of items that are already there, again passed in on the items request arguments that come into the function. And we calculate the last item that we want to return as being the position of the first item plus the number of new items. Of course, we've got to check to make sure that that last item we're trying to return isn't greater than the number of rows that are in the data set. If it is, then we set the end to be the number of rows that are in the data set. And if those two numbers are equal, the end and the number of rows, then we pass back the fact that we've reached the end of the items so that there are not subsequent requests made. Then we set up this counter i to start at the position in the data set. Remember, we're zero based. That is just one item past the number of items that are already 
present in the drop down list. And then we go through this loophole where less than the end, we're going to add a new red combo box item. And the red combo box item constructor here takes two parameters, one for the text and one for the value that's made up of the product name in the data row that we're retrieving and also the product ID from the data row that we're currently dealing with. And so that gets added into our red combo box items. We increment the counter and finish the while loop. Then the last thing that we do in this function is we set up the message that's displayed down at the bottom of the combo box. So as you can see, this message it can be in any format that you want. You don't have to go through and tell them the number of items, although that's pretty useful information and a, and a good thing to tell them at the bottom of a drop-down like that. But you can set your own message up right here using this formatting statement. And the alternative message is if there are no rows returned, we tell them there's no matches. We also tell them there's no matches if there's an error. You might want to handle that a little bit differently, but for purposes of the example, we're just going to say there's no matches if we encounter an error. So there's one other item of business that we need to take care of here is that we've already connected up our RAD combo box so that it's got a data source and the data text field and so forth. And if we leave that connection there, it's going to go populate it for us by virtue of the fact that we've done it declaratively inside our web page. So let's just take out the information about how to connect the combo box up to SQL data source and rely on our code behind to do that for us. And when we run the application, if you hit the drop down, you see that we have 10 items listed. So we've got a couple of different ways to get new items. One is to click down here in that you see now we've gone to items 1 through 20 out of 79. And then once you've gotten a minimum number of uh, items on the screen, and that looks to be here like about 30 or so, the virtual scrolling kicks in so that if I click down below the vertical scroll bar here, you see the number on the bottom changes to 40. If I click again, it changes to 50. Now I've got 50 items displayed. And I can still use the scroll bars to actually scroll and anytime you go past the end of, of what it thinks is the end of the data display, you're going to get more items loaded till eventually you can work it down to 79 or whatever the maximum number of items is inside the drop down. The final thing we're going to take a look at with the RAD combo box in this video is how to do auto completion and to put in multiple items. In order to accomplish that, there are only two additional properties that we need to set. The first one is that we need to set an autocomplete separator. So we'll add a semicolon in here as our separator character. And the second thing that we need to do is set the mark first match property to true. And then for the purposes of this demonstration, it probably makes sense to reverse a couple of the other settings we've made. That's enable load on demand and enable virtual scrolling, which also means that we should add back in the data source ID, SQL data source one, with the product name being our data text field and the data value field being determined by the product ID. And with those slight changes, we'll go back and run the application and you see once again we've got everything displayed inside the drop-down. If we click in the text area and type in the first few letters of a product, you'll see that it goes out and finds Kanbu for us, even though I only typed in the KON. The auto-completion goes out and finds the rest of the word for me. To accept this, I hit my right arrow. Now, if I put in a separator, which we defined as the semicolon, I can type in another item and let's say it's that shoggy chocolata there so we type in SCH and it goes out and finds the rest now one thing you'll notice here is that I did not include a space after the semicolon if I tried to include a space after the semicolon it's going to take that very literally when it tries to find the match so let's say this this third item down here this nord northeast whatever it is 
if I were to put in a space and then NOR, it's not going to find the match because it considers the space of part as part of what it needs to match. So that's how you get auto completion and multiple items being selected in your combo box. For more Telerik videos, technical discussion forums, and examples, please go to www.telerik.com.